Good morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to the service of worship at First Presbyterian Church, Hilton Head Island. I'm Associate Pastor Diane Knopf, and on behalf of our Senior Pastor, Will Robinson, our Summer Sanctuary Choir, uh, Jerry Anderson, and our Guest Choir Director for today, Dennis Smith. Yay, Dennis. We are so glad to be joining with you in worship of Almighty God this morning. Today we begin a sermon series answering your questions of faith and Pastor Will has a powerful sermon on forgiveness so you'll want to uh, be at the edge of your seat as you receive uh, this guidance from scripture and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're so glad that the Spirit has led you here this morning, whether you are a longtime member, first-time visitor, whether you're joining us online or here in our sanctuary. I invite you to go ahead and take those red friendship registers on the beginning of your pew rows and ask that you go ahead and put your name and other information on them, and then please just pass them along the row. Um, when they get to the end, just send them on back, and as they come back, take a look at at the names of the folks seated around you and in just a little while we will have a chance to pass the peace of Christ and if we can call one another by name uh, so much the better as we connect to one another in this family of faith and for those of you who are joining us online we want to get to know you as well and celebrate that you are here take a moment to go to our homepage uh, fpchhi.org and right in the middle, you'll find a blue connect button. Just give that a click. There'll be a brief form that you can fill out just to let you, uh, let us know that you're with us and help us better connect with you and you with us. And if you have a prayer request, please remember there is a prayer box in the narthex. There are prayer cards. Go ahead and fill that out. Put it in the box and be assured that uh, Pastor Will and I and our staff will be praying praying for you at our Tuesday staff meeting. And there is also an opportunity, if you'd like, to have it also go to our confidential prayer chain as they will continue to lift your needs or your joys up in prayer. Well, a joy that I have, and I know the rest of us will as well, Monday begins our summer camp 2023, and we have 65 children that will be coming to be with us this week, and a good deal of those are from our community, so we celebrate that. We ask your prayers for a very successful and spirit-filled week, and we give big thanks to those who have volunteered. We can't do it without you. So uh, thank you, thank you, and you'll hear more about it in the coming week and next Sunday as well as we give you a full report. Well, with that in mind and with the joy of being together in this place, I go ahead and I light the candle on our communion table simply a way of giving uh, a tangible sign of what is intangible but yet very present, the power of the Holy Spirit connecting us as one through time and space, through those who are worshiping with us online. So let that be what binds us together now as we join our hearts in worship of Almighty God.
take my time. <laughs> Good morning again. <laughs> uh, please rise in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our sins. In gratitude and joy, let us worship God. We'll have to work on Jim Wood's Presbyterian timing. <laughs> Our scripture this morning is from Matthew 18. It'll be a couple of verses that we will see here in a moment on the screen and hear. And then after we hear the scripture read, I will then retell the parable in my own words that our Lord tells right after these verses. Let us listen to the word of the Lord. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if my brother or sister sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 70 times, seven times. And then our Lord told his disciples this parable. There was a king, a king who had slaves, and those slaves owed him money. They were in debt to that king. One of those slaves owed a massive debt to that king that he was not able to pay. So the king said to him, I am going to sell you, your wife, your children, and all that you have to pay every last denarii of the debt that you owe me. But that slave begged the king for mercy, begged the king for more time. And the king did 
have mercy on that slave and even forgave that slave all of his massive debt. But then that slave owned a slave of his own. And he went to that slave, and this, his own slave owed him money, had a debt to him. And he said to that slave, his own slave, you owe me. You must pay me now. His own slave said to this slave, please, I beg you, give me more time. I will pay back the debt that I owe you. But the slave did not have mercy on his own slave. No, instead, he threw his own slave into prison until he would pay every denarii of the debt that he owed him. Now, when the king heard about this, he was angry. And he said to this slave, you should have showed your own slave mercy as I showed you. You should have forgiven him even as I forgave you. And so because you did not, I'm going to punish you until you pay back every bit of what you owe me. And then our Lord said to the disciples, so my heavenly Father will do to every one of us unless we forgive from our hearts. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. God, through your Spirit, may these words that we have heard and that we will hear be your holy word to us, increasing our faith in you and helping us to forgive like Jesus. Amen. As Pastor Diane said in her welcome this morning, this is the first in our summer sermon and worship series based on Scripture where we're trying to address the questions that you have submitted to us, questions about faith, questions about the Bible. Now, we won't be able to answer every question that you submitted, but we will answer nine of them beginning with this Sunday. So we'll have eight more Sundays where we will do our best as the Spirit guides us to address your questions. The first question that we are addressing, today's question is this. A member submitted this to us. I believe that God is love, but I saw a counselor who told me that my abusive parent doesn't deserve my love. This is confusing to me. How do love and forgiveness work? First, we want to say how much we appreciate this member entrusting us with this particular question and to try our best to address this question. We're also answering it because we know that others of you have experienced abuse in your own lives, possibly from a parent or parents like this member, or from another member of your family or someone you didn't even know. And we have young members of this congregation who have been bullied or are being bullied. As I thought about what this member submitted, I thought of the question like this. As Christians, are there limits to our love and our forgiveness? Is abuse, for example, unforgivable so that we would not extend love or forgiveness to an abuser? In today's scripture, Peter is asking that question. Lord, if my brother or sister sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Peter here is willing to forgive, right? In fact, he thinks seven times is very generous. And of course, we know that number seven is a number of completion, a number of wholeness. But 
Peter also knows what we know, that sin hurts sometimes, abuse especially, and that there are traumatic wrongs that are sometimes done to us. So he's asking our Lord, is there a limit to forgiveness? Are there sins we don't have to forgive? Our Lord's answer, as you heard here, is emphatic. Not seven times, Peter, but I tell you, 70 times seven times. Jesus' answer here, of course, is not a math problem. No, it's hyperbole. Peter want, uh, Jesus wants Peter and the disciples then, and us, his disciples today, to know that there is no limit to forgiveness. There's no statute of limitations on forgiveness. And then Jesus hammers this home in the parable. This king, read God, forgives this slave 10,000 talents. Now, what you may not know is that is an astronomical debt. It combines the largest Greek number and the largest unit of currency. Even one talent was a small fortune, especially for a slave in the first century. 10,000 talents is unimaginable. It would be like a busboy who works at a restaurant owing the CEO of Apple a trillion dollars. He would not be able to pay it back. And yet the king, God, forgives all of it. And what does the slave do? He refuses to forgive his own slave, a hundred denarii. Now, a hundred denarii was about a hundred days wages, but it was only a fraction. It was still a big amount, but only a fraction of what that slave had owed the king. But unlike the king, that slave has no mercy on his own slave. He does not forgive him. And what does the king do? The king is angry, and he punishes that slave because of his ingratitude, having been forgiven, and his unwillingness to forgive the debt of his own slave. And then Jesus says to his disciples then and to us this day, so my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive one another from your heart. One commentator on these verses writes, in light of God's incalculable forgiveness of us, it is ludicrous for us to refuse to forgive others. In light of God's incalculable forgiveness of us, it is ludicrous for us to refuse to forgive others. So as Christians, there are no limits on our love. We're to love even our enemies. We don't have to like them. We're to love them. And there's no limit on our forgiveness. There is no sin, wrong, that is unforgivable. And that's why this member says that this member was confused because this member wanted to be able to extend that forgiveness, to extend that love to this parent who had abused this member. So there is no limit to our forgiveness. At the same time, we need to know what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not condoning, ignoring, or excusing the wrong. Jesus says nothing about ignoring or excusing or con condoning the wrong. Indeed, in God's eyes, sin is wrong. It is not acceptable. And maybe that's why the counselor to this member did not, said that she did not believe her parent deserved her love because in the mind of this counselor, it would be condoning or possibly excusing that abuse. Number two, forgiveness is also not a lack of accountability or punishment. Indeed, in the parable, that slave is punished. 
And in fact, reporting abuse, for example, can be an expression of love of neighbor because it, pre because it prevents the abuser from abusing more. Reporting abuse can also be an expression of love for the abuser because it holds that abuser accountable and praying that that abuser would possibly repent, would stop that. Third, forgiveness is not demanded, forced, or coerced. In an article that I read in preparation for today's sermon, the example they gave, a true example, was, was of a family where family members had abused another member of the family. And they basically said to this abused member of their family, the Bible says you have to forgive us. So you have to forgive us. And as that article explains, and as we know, that is not forgiveness. When it is forced, it is done to silence the abused. It is used as a weapon to silence the abused. Forgiveness is never involuntary. Forgiveness is only voluntary. Fourth, forgiveness is not at times without anger, or I like the phrase righteous indignation. That's what we were hearing in today's scripture passage. As philosopher Nicholas Wolterstorff observes, our justified anger at wrongdoers and their wrongdoing presupposes our self-worth being made in the image of God. And therefore, anger is not incompatible with forgiveness. At times, anger will not be incompatible with forgiveness. Fifth, to forgive is not necessarily to forget. We hear that phrase, forgive and forget. And some sins, some wrongs, we are able to forgive and forget. But to forgive is not necessarily to forget. A couple weeks ago, I was vacationing with my family, and we visited Washington, D.C., and when we were there, we also visited the Holocaust Museum. And that museum is not there to preserve anger and bitterness. It is there, as it says in several places, to help us to remember so it never occurs again, never again. And the same is true for us. There will be times, especially with abuse, we will need to remember that so we're not abused again. We do not let it occur or happen again. But it's a remembering without bitterness. It's a remembering without bitterness because we are forgiving. As Christians, there are no limits to our love and our forgiveness, but we know, we need to know what forgiveness is not. And we could have added, I know, possibly others to this list. I also want to say or add that forgiveness sometimes is a process. I think especially in today's example of abuse. Forgiveness is sometimes a process. Jesus doesn't say in today's text, for example, you must forgive now. You must forgive right now on the spot. He only says you must forgive. But our Lord expects us to begin that process. He expects us to work at forgiveness. I like what Pastor Diane said in her sermon back in Lent when we were preaching on the Lord's Prayer. She reminded us of the school shooting in an Amish community in Pennsylvania, uh, the 10 children, 10 Amish children who died in that shooting. The shooter was a man local to the community, uh, and he killed himself also. The Amish families of those 10 children publicly forgave the killer. And what's more, they befriended his family, his parents, his wife, and his three young children. And then in her sermon, Diane added that Stephen Nolt, who was a professor of Amish studies, that Stephen Nolt, that professor of Amish studies, explained why the Amish forgive as they do. Nolt said, as Christians, the Amish forgive first 
and then work every day through the emotions of it. The Amish forgive first, and then every day work through the emotions of it. He calls it decisional forgiveness. I like that phrase, decisional forgiveness. They decide to forgive as the Lord has taught us, and then they work through the emotions of it. And this isn't easy. This was hard even for the families, those Amish families. A father of one of the children who died in that shooting said that every day he fights back his anger. Every day he has to choose again to forgive. And he does it because it's what his faith asks him to do. It's what his Lord asks him to do. Thanks be to God, we do not have to forgive on our own. Thanks be to God, we have a helper in the Holy Spirit. And I do love that prayer of Anne Lamott, one of the best prayers we can pray as Christians. Help me, help me, help me, Lord. Help me, Spirit, in me so that I am able to forgive. I forgive. Help me to work through the emotions of that. And of course, the Bible. We need to be in our Bibles. I was reading a devotional uh, this past week on Thursday, and the title of the devotional was Forgiveness and Healing. Forgiveness and Healing. I needed to read that to be reminded of what I have committed to do. And then I think also of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And what's the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. And I like what Protestant theologian Reinhold Niebuhr says, that forgiveness is the final form of love. Forgiveness is the final form of love. But we need the Spirit to help us to live that as we should. And in the end, the truth is that forgiveness helps us more than it does even the person we're forgiving. I like, for example, what Desmond Tutu says. Tutu, of course, was the Anglican Archbishop of South Africa, Nobel Peace Prize winner because of his work on forgiveness and reconciliation of those perpetrators of apartheid. And he knew the power of forgiveness. He knew there should be no limit to it, but he also knew how hard that was to do. Think about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He says these words about how much forgiveness is needed even just for us, the people who forgive. He writes, we don't forgive to help the other person. We don't forgive for others. We forgive for ourselves. And then Michael Linval, a Presbyterian pastor who's now retired, adds to what Tutu says when he writes, forgiveness is not so much a gift to the one who wronged us. It is more a gift to us because to forgive is to choose not to carry the emotional baggage into our future. Because to forgive is to choose not to carry the emotional baggage, the anger, the bitterness, whatever the emotion is, into our future. And then Bell Hooks, the poet, I think summarizes it when she summarizes this when she writes, forgiveness and compassion or love are always linked. How do we hold people accountable for the wrongdoing and yet at the same time remain in touch with their humanity enough to believe in their capacity to be transformed? How do we hold people accountable for wrongdoing and yet at the same time remain in touch with their humanity enough to believe in their capacity to be transformed? So sometimes forgiveness is a process, especially when I think of wrongs like abuse. But we are led by the Spirit to begin that process. That's what our Lord is asking us to do, decisional forgiveness, knowing that the best gift we give in doing that is the gift we give to ourselves. I want to end by just asking you this question. As a Christian, as a follower of the Lord, who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to forgive? 
Amen and Amen. Having heard the good news about forgiveness in sermon and song, let us confess our sins to God and to one another in the words of the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin and on the screen. Also note that we are providing a time for silent confession at the end of this prayer. Please join me in the confession. Merciful God, we confess that sometimes we don't forgive We hold grudges, we are bitter and spiteful, or we withhold forgiveness. Forgive us when we're unwilling to forgive as we should, when we don't turn the other cheek, and when we fail to love our enemies. Through your Spirit, inspire and empower us to forgive, even as you have forgiven us in your Son, our Lord. And now we take this moment of silent confession to further confess our sins and ask for forgiveness. We worship a God who readily forgives us. Forgiveness is part of His extravagant and steadfast love. Be assured of His forgiveness, thankfully accept it, and in the same spirit of love through which we receive forgiveness, let us forgive others.
Oh man, can't you feel that peace just descend upon us as we know we are forgiven and freed. So let us now share that peace and that joy in the Lord with one another. Um, and let's begin by first giving a big wave to those who are joining us online. God's peace be with you. Please join me in prayer. Dearest Lord, thank you for the magnificence and grandeur of your creation. Thank you for the stars, the sun, and the moon. Thank you for the beauty of this earth, for mountains and vast oceans. Thank you for the beauty of the low country where we are blessed to live, for the tides and the marshes, for great live oaks, for the beaches and dolphins. Thank you for creating us and for giving us the privilege of living among so much beauty. It continues to astound us that although you are the creator of the universe and all its vastness, you are also most deeply invested in each of our lives. Thank you for your love, your patience, your faithfulness. And particularly today, Lord, we thank you for your willingness to forgive us, despite our so often not living the lives that you created us to live. Your son, who died for the forgiveness of our sins, taught us so much about forgiveness. He taught us that no matter how far we stray from the path that you created us to follow, there is always a way back when we ask you to forgive us. And he taught us that we were made to not only be a forgiven people, but also a forgiving people. You command that of us because it is the only way that it can, we can break the cycle of hate, bitterness, and retribution that stands in the way of your kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. And you command that of us because you know that is the only way we can be a truly free people, that being able to forgive allows us to live bigger lives, lives no longer weighed down from the burdens that we carry with us when we don't forgive. Lord, please bless every person who is with us, both in this sanctuary and online. Please comfort those of us who are struggling with illness and the illness of loved ones. Please bless those who have lost loved ones and still feel the pain of that loss. Please bless and guide those of us who are suffering from difficult times in our life, however great or small. Please grant us comfort, Lord. Please give us vision, Lord. Please grant us peace as only you can give. Please bless the children and counselors as they begin camp tomorrow. And we ask that this be a wonderful experience for all. Finally, Lord, please help us to feel your holy presence today and in the week ahead. And please fill us with a renewed commitment to use our lives to glorify you and indeed help your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. 
We now pray the silent prayers of our hearts. And now, dearest Lord, we pray the prayer that your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Today, I have the pleasure of sharing some good news. I am returning from my 11th trip to East Africa this fall, supporting Marion Medical Missions in their efforts to build at least 3,500 wells in seven weeks. In 2022, 3,820 wells were built, serving an estimated 382,000 people, of which 229,200 were children. Since 1990, over 50,000 wells have been built. Over 5 million people served in Zambia, Malawi, and Tanzania. The program is now expanding into Mozambique as well. Since COVID struck, we have been unable to send full teams of volunteers. This year, two full teams will be on the ground, 31 total American volunteers, plus countless Africans. Volunteers pay all of their own expenses for their three-week stay. All donations to Marion Medical Mission go directly to the building of the wells unless designated for other costs such as trucks, overhead, and so forth. Volunteers drive four-wheel drive Toyota Land Cruiser trucks with pipe racks, delivering pipes, pumps, cement, and downhole parts, record the conducting we record the GPS and well gathering data on Android tablets, as well as conducting the well dedication service. Most become accomplished bush drivers after three weeks driving through creeks, streams, dirt roads, and making footpaths into four-wheel drive access roads. As my guide would tell me, just pretend it's a road and plow forward in four-wheel drive. A typical well serves a village of 80 to 125 people at a cost of $450 per well. I've set up a table in the gathering space to provide more information, and I'm showing videos on the overhead screens. Additional videos and program information can be accessed on YouTube, Facebook, and the Marion Medical Mission website. Our support for Marion Medical Mission is not supported by a line item in the global outreach budget, but, but contributions made directly by you to support clean water. Your continued support will be greatly appreciated as Americans provide the financial means and the Africans the labor, materials, and everything else. Over 14 million people in the rural areas of Malawi, Tanzania, and Zambia lack access to safe drinking water. The largest source of disease is from unsafe drinking water in sub-Sahara Africa. The average distance of African walks to collect water is 3.7 miles. As a congregation, we have been asked to support a wide variety of mission activities this year. It has been a challenge to meet those needs in the current economic circumstances. I would ask that you prayerfully consider helping to fund these life-saving wells, whether it be a single well or partially, for water is life. I would also ask that you keep in your prayers the volunteers who will be on the ground in September and October. I know firsthand the power of supporters' prayers as spending three weeks in the African bush is not only an adrenaline rush, but has its trials and tribulations. Nevertheless, I can't wait to again participate in the miracle of providing safe drinking water to the hundreds of thousands of Africans. 
please take the time to visit our table and find out more about this program. Thank you. Thank you very much, I was just going to say, and we will be praying for you and your team as you head out this fall. Sometimes the love of God looks like a cup of cold water given in his name. Sometimes it looks like the words, I forgive you. Sometimes it looks like opening the doors of our facility and welcoming, welcoming in our community. No matter what it looks like, you are a part of sharing that love each and every time you give to the work of this church. And we trust by the power of the Holy Spirit that what we give will be knit together and made into something much greater than it might ever be on its own. So let us give generously, gratefully, and with the confidence that God will use what we give and us for his glory.
Let us pray. We bring our offering not with thought of reward, but because we are grateful. We give not from guilt over having much, but because it is such a privilege and a joy to share. O oh God, accept what we bring and use it to meet basic human needs with the good news of the gospel, whether that be a cup of cold water, words of forgiveness, or whatever act makes your presence real for those who need you most. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can't see it, but I am wearing a tie that has fish on it, and all the fish are swimming in the same direction. I have a pastor friend who has a tie with fish on it, and all of them are swimming in the same direction except for one. It's a reminder to us as Christians that we are countercultural. We are like that one fish following our Lord, because the culture would teach us to hold grudges, to get even, but we are taught otherwise to live the forgiveness of our Lord. Knowing that, who do you need to forgive? And know that you never do that on your own. You do it by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the love of God the Father, and through the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and lives in us. And all of God's forgiven people said, Amen.
thanks to Jerry, thanks to Pat. Thank you. Saturday, one o'clock for for the, the Memorial Service. Bring your robes.